All right, I think uh, we'd better make a start. It's past three o'clock, so it's a real pleasure to welcome Dr. Carlos Cesar Boff Dufour uh, as our win uh, seminar speaker today. Did I get that right? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Well trained. Um, Carlos is the head of the Laboratory for Functional Devices and Systems at the Brazilian National Nanotechnology Laboratory, or LL, LN Nano as it's called, and the Center for Research in Energy and Materials, CNPEM. Uh, in Campinas, uh, Brazil. Carlos was born in Brazil and he studied uh, physics at the Federal University of Viscosa, graduating with a bachelor's degree in 2000. He did a master's degree in physics at the University of Sao Paulo, which is actually one of Brazil's top universities, probably the top one, yeah. in 2003. Then he went to Germany for a PhD in physics at the Heinrich Heine University of Dusseldorf in 2006. In 2007, he joined the Institute for Integrative Nanosciences at the Leibniz uh, Institute in Dresden as a postdoc, and from 2008 to 12, he coordinated a research group on nanostructured hybrid devices at both the Leibniz Institute and the Technical University of Chemnitz, which is a, a neighboring city. Uh, Dr. Buffon's interests are broad, and they range from inorganic semiconductor materials such as indium arsenide, gallium arsenide, quantum dots, through hybrid organic inorganic uh, molecular heterojunctions based on strained nanomembranes to organic nanomembrane based sensors for rabbit in situ acid uh, detection. Carlos has a large group of uh, 17 co workers and is a guest professor in the graduate program at Campinas State University, or Unicamp as it's called. I should add that, uh, that Wynn and uh, and LLL and Nano and CNPEM signed a collaborative agreement in 2013, and Carlos, the, Carlos's visit here is part of our efforts to stimulate exchange of faculty uh, and students through joint research projects. So please welcome uh, Dr. Carlos Buffon for his talk, Hybrid Organic Inorganic Devices Based on Nanomembranes. Carlos. Thank you, Arthur, for a kind introduction. Thank you, everybody, to be here uh, almost after lunch, yeah. Also, thank you, the colleagues that was walking me around today, showing me this very interesting place. Uh, I hope that uh, after my, my talk, you'll be able to see a little bit of things that I have done in the past uh, seven years. Uh, also, not only in Brazil, but a lot of things done here show, that you show here was developed in Germany during my time as a postdoc, as a researcher there. And uh, a lot of the stuff I was um, were doing in Brazil right now. Uh, I went back to Brazil two and a half years ago to assemble a new laboratory, this uh, laboratory for functional devices and systems. And uh, uh, one of the goals was uh, also implement a novel uh, research on nanotechnology, but also think a little bit more about uh, problems that you find down in South America and how can you use a nanotechnology to address such problems. So this we are centered here in this uh, campus nearby Campinas, uh, actually in Campinas City nearby the, the Unicampi. So this is a nanotechnology. Now we have additional building here. And here's the, the region where they build the, uh, another synchrotron. Uh, is a Sirius, is a third generation synchrotron. So our center uh, hosts four national laboratories, the synchrotron laboratory, a laboratory for uh, bioscience, a laboratory for uh, research on bioethanol, and the youngest one, the Elenano, that was founded uh, sometime around 2011. And uh, since then, we start to create different groups and expand our scientific interests. So we go from advanced materials, so to safe and non-polluting energy, to biotechnology and nanotechnology. So we have different access. Uh, since we are a national lab, we have to be worried about the in-house research. You know, the open, first, open research facilities. Actually, we provide infrastructure to several groups in Brazil that can use uh, uh, tools or process or methods that we develop over there. Uh, basically, for, for uh, governmental groups or basic universities, it's for free. They can come, they can use, and they can produce their results over there. And also for companies. Uh, so. We have also in-house research that is, uh, we have some access or some projects that are some demand from the governmental or industries and we try to develop in this point. Also we support for innovation for industries and this is a demand that is increasing. 
and education training. It's not a regular uh, education like uh, uh, graduate programs, but we train technicians and we supervise students uh, from the local university like uh, Sao Paulo University, Campinas University. So they come to do their thesis in our group and then I'm uh, basically a guest professor in those universities. Okay, our uh, economic sector is, is quite broad in Brazil. We go from oil and gas to energy and sensors. That is one of the fields I'm heavily involved in. Uh, different companies have uh, uh, developed projects with us from Statoil, Petrobras, that is our, one of our biggest companies, Embraer. So, and also several medium and small size companies that start to increase a lot in the past three years. Okay, uh, how is the research scope of my, my group, basically? So we go from material science, extreme engineering, uh, nanomicrofabrication, self-assembly. We combine those areas to create what we call smart architectures that lead us to functional devices. Basically, we combine organic and organic materials, top-down and bottom-up approach, and try to create what we call hybrid organic and organic metamaterials. From the beginning, we start to work with nanomembranes, that will be the main topic here, but now we are also exploring these possibilities in other platforms. When you call about Brazilian strategic fields where we are into, uh, and especially when you think how can we address some problems, we could map uh, basically four different areas. First, fuel quality control. As you know, Brazil also produces a lot of ethanol as a fuel. We have hybrid cars uh, like mine. You know, can even tank pure ethanol or gasoline or the mixture. So, and the, the quality of this uh, this ethanol, for instance, from production till the end user, is also a, a issue. I'll explain you a little bit why. Food quality control. I think this is a worldwide problem. We have to ensure uh, the quality of the food, and especially now that we have globalized world that the uh, strawberries you eat here probably come from. Uh, uh, North Africa and so on, so how can you storage, how can you ensure the, the, the quality? Or even to the end the consumer, for instance, the, about the, the orange juice your kid drink at the kindergarten, you know, it's, uh, it has the amount of vitamin C, is, is the right, how, how can you check it? How, can you trust the label? Yeah, who was the last one to, to test the label? Never know. So in, uh, environmental and health monitoring, especially uh, water, yeah, I'll also explain a little bit why this is a strategic field in Brazil and maybe all over the world. Yeah, this is a strategic field, you have to, to worry a little bit. Yeah. So, uh, in the past years, uh, we have uh, spent a lot of time researching hybrid materials that goes from the synthesis of organic thin films on novel substrates. The main issue here is that, uh, or the main point is that we have a huge amount of biomass in Brazil, like the sugar can bagasse. Can you add value to these products so you have just to burn it, or can you transform it into something more sustainable? We think about a, a substrate, for instance. Can you prepare paper out of this and make devices out of this, paper-based electronics from baguettes instead of uh, a standard cellulose from the eucalyptus, for instance? So micro and nanofabrication, nowadays more micro than nano, but towards uh, nano, I think in the near future, our center will be also involved in more nanofabrication. And in my case, it's more specifically go organic film films. How can you pattern structures like this, like a polypyro thin line or structures using common normal lithography? Uh, patterning, scaling up, how can you go this in a large scale? And fabrication of hybrid heterojunctions and functional devices. In other case, the characterization of this organic and organic interface, mainly electron transport or charge transport in these structures. That's one of the, our main areas. So we have a, uh, from sensors, on paper-based sensors, to patterning and characterization of, of organic films, for instance. Another tale is based on the freestanding nanomembranes that I'll explain a, a little bit later the, what means these nanomembranes that comes also from the synthesis of these devices or the, these layers was the fabrication and characterization of hybrid molecular heteron junctions, and finally the, the nanomembrane-based devices. So, uh, what is nanomembrane? Uh, somebody wants to define nanomembrane as a structure, and or its thickness is less than two orders of magnitude of, of your lateral dimension. But since then, this uh, definition of nanomembrane evolves a little bit more. Uh, people said, okay, can be also freestanding if it's not electrostatically or electronically coupled with your substrate. Can be there, but there is no interaction with your substrate. 
and I saw one presentation the guy called uh, quasi free stranding graphene because the graphene was on the surface but there was no interaction with the substrate. So they then start to call a free standing uh, layer. Okay, regardless of the definition, I could say that is a, it has some features that are very thin like a graphene sheet or can be flexible like this silicon devices embedded in PDMS. Can be also a strange in here, you can use the, the internal forces and shape this material, let nature shape and you make use of this. Or you tell nature, okay, go from here to there or stop here, keep going. So how can you control this? And one interesting feature is that it's patternable. You can create like tubes, belts, and here array of tubes. That's a basically the architecture that I have uh, mainly explored in the, in the past years. So, uh, the applications I'm going to talk today, they explore a few features of nanomembrane. The first is the, the, first is the mechanical flexibility, that you can make a, a device transition from two-dimensional to dimensional shape, is one way you make this transition. And one typical case, you can reduce the device footprint area, so how much area they occupy on a surface. Then you come to the quasi-dimensional nature of the membrane that is uh, so thin, or like a, a polymer, it's so thin that you can really let gases pass through and filter a few and speed up the, some reactions. Next is the patterning and the integration capabilities. How can you really take this membrane and put the, the shape you want and also whatever you need. So we can also create this 3D device and also one area that attracts me a lot is hybrid heterojunctions. So how can you shape it yeah, is the first question. How can you make this transition? Yeah, it's basically this is a science by itself. Yeah, I have some colleagues that uh, they devote their career simply to understand, understand the art of shaping these membranes. Why they don't simply delaminate or they curl or they wrinkle, how it works. Uh, yeah. I confess that I may simply make use, I know the borders and I try to make them roll. And I figure out in the lab how to make them roll. And one of the main features is combine layers can be of the same material or different materials with different stress configuration. You can have one layer with a compressive stress combined with a layer of tensile stress. And once you remove it from the surface, the material tries to roll. Depends on the, the intensity of this internal uh, force. You can also wrinkle, you can also delaminate or crack. That is the, the simplest uh, uh, manifestation of this phenomenon when the stress is too high. Actually, this was a huge problem in the microelectronic in the past. This is the reason why I use sputtering to deposit contacts and not electron beam, because they delaminate. Actually, for me, I'm very lucky because since uh, only 5% of the scientific results is, is uh, uh, successful, I have 95% of uh, misery in the delamination as, uh, in my side, because I have a lot of information what makes material delaminate. And I use in favor to try to make this roll. In our case, the, the, the recipe is, is quite straightforward. We start with our basic substrate. Then can be glass, silicon, silicon dioxide, silicon, gallium arsenide, so on and so forth. And then you place our sacrificial layer that also there is a plenty of solutions and can be photoresist, can be germanium dioxide that dissolves in water. Those that try to make a MOSFET with germanium knows this, and this is the reason why for years this never managed to work as a transistor. And I use actually this knowledge that dissolves in water uses as a sacrificial layer. So it can be aluminum arsenide in the case of semiconductors or even germanium. Can place a, a metallic layer, for instance, or oxide or semiconductor, and a second layer with a different uh, stress or, or, or stress configuration, or it could be a, a stress gradient, it also works. What happens when you start to remove the sacrificial layer, that can be also a combination of water, H2O2, AGF with water, depending if you have a semiconducting like aluminum arsenide or acetone, if you have a photoresist. Once you start to remove the material, try to keep rolling, okay? This is more or less how it happens. In a typical case, this is an array of tubes. You can see on the surface, well spaced. Uh, you can generate tubes from five microns to 100 microns, be in the keep the tube shape. And depending on the, in the this is the experimental condition of this particular tube, yeah? Substrate of silicon, silicon dioxide, sacrificial layer germanium dioxide, titanium chromium. One is compressed, the other one has a tensile stress. When you remove this in water, the stress releases the material curve. So the first application that you figured out a few years ago in Germany was, ah, 
uh, one of the main issues for energy storage elements that uh, they occupy a large space. Why not shrink and use this as a, as a possibility? Yeah? So actually you could fold, you could roll the device. You know, historically people roll things to save space. You know, try to imagine if you should receive, you know, your, your toilet paper unrolled. Yeah, you stop a truck in front of you, oh, here's your weak demand for paper. Yeah, tanks that can be rolled. Yeah, the same is valid for steel or as old as this manuscript. So, so the, the solution was pretty straightforward. We have a, a sacrificial layer on top of uh, silicon dioxide. So our first capacitor layer was our strayed by layer, and then come oxide, and then another metallic layer, and another oxide layer. The reason for the last oxide layer is that when you start to remove your sacrificial layer to roll, the bottom metal plate you touch the surface. So then a part of rolling, you, have, you gain capacitance also. Yeah? Basically, you, you have twice the area. And you can ideally create very nice arrays. So this is an old example, yeah, how the system rolls. In this case, is, is not in German, it's photoresist. And uh, here's a typical case of uh, a lithographic process uh, done on a planar device. You can see one millimeter long, about 200 microns wide. This is before rolling. The dielectric here is aluminum oxide, six nanometers of aluminum oxide. And after you roll, you can see you compress everything in a three-dimensional device. That is a microtube, something like a 10 microns diameter. So basically, you have a device that's 10, hundred times shorter. Of course, you can lift a lot of questions. Okay, but the space is still there. If you don't remove it from here, we still have the space. So then you have to pick up this tube, or you have to process more layers. I mean, you have to be creative to how to take it out of this region. Or you can occupy with a different circuitry. Or you could do this on top of another uh, structure, already pattern. So there are plenty of solutions for this. So this work evolved a lot in the past years. Uh, we can pattern several devices on a ship. Here's a, a ship, how this whole how looks like, the cross-section by focus angle. You can see very nice how the system is compared. You can see also some voids in some regions. Uh, you have a stem DS map of all the elements, titanium, chromium, and the aluminum from the aluminum oxide. This is already a recent paper. Uh, so the LED characterization you can see here, you simply measure the capacitance as a, function of the uh, as a function of the frequency before and after rolling. You can see before rolling and after rolling, you have a, a small frequency dependence, probably because of interface states in the mechanical made junction, but you can go uh, roughly twice. And then you see when you increase the number of winds, actually your capacitance increase to a ratio of two, yeah? And the capacitor footprint reach about 250. You can see here yeah, by that time, 2010, we, we increase the capacitor footprint, not change the oxide, but change the area occupied by the, the device. So it means you have a, you increase the degree of freedom. You can change your dielectric material, but you also can change the geometry of your system. So the, we managed to move to change the design for a double tube capacitor. As you can see, is a capacitor one come from the right or the one come from the left. You can create a longer arrays, uh, shorter or one single side, and a full wafer with about 1,500 devices on a four inches weight. So it means it's scalable. This was covered for advanced energy materials last year. Uh, we also identify um, this picture simply show the ratio between the capacitance of roll device and the planner and how the, the amount of half new embedded in between aluminum oxide uh, changed the capacitance. Yeah, so basically this will give you a message uh, how much the material has the effects on the rolling, if they increase or not the capacitance. So we test a lot of titanium oxide and half new embedded on aluminum oxide because if you do direct titanium oxide or half new, the leakage current in six nanometers is really huge. So then you make a sandwich of aluminum oxide, uh, another uh, either titanium or half new and aluminum oxide again. So you, and you play with the quantity of this, those materials. Okay, the message here is that, okay, you can roll, but you can also uh, change the design. You can increase the number of devices, also the dielectric material. So we have a nice uh, pathway to try different things. Yeah. Uh, one uh, other phase of this project was, okay, how can I get a tonability? How can I change the material? Then comes from 
uh, from some solutions presented a, a few years ago by Hagen Klauck and his group that uh, on organic transistors they managed to drop the operation voltage to a few volts by simply adding on top of the aluminum oxide layer a uh, self-assembly monolayer. And they, uh, yeah, the main output was this. They brought the voltage from 30 volts to 3 volts. So I could, ah, if, what happens if you also add on top of aluminum oxide layer also a self-assembly monolayer. So basically you have a hybrid dielectric. We have uh, inorganic uh, aluminum oxide, but you also have an organic layer that you can change for instance the number of carbons. Yeah? So we did so uh, based on top of the aluminum oxide, we grew a self-assembly monolayer. And we could see here first is uh, how is the phase in a frequency dependence. When you don't have a self-assembly monolayer, it's basically leaky or is resistive. Yeah? Oh, sorry, here is leaky. You can see almost zero. And, but when you add the self-assembly monolayer, you recover the capacitive behavior of your system. So here show uh, the comparison of the density of currents as a function of the electric field. After you, incre you include the self-assembly monolayer, you, you manage to extend the operation voltage or the electric field you apply uh, almost twice. So this is what gain. It means depending on our customer, I'll show this figure, uh, you can say, look, uh, I, I, I need more capacitance, but not leak, but I, I can afford the leakage current. Okay, that, that's fine. Then you can put basically no molecule. You can put a, a six carbon uh, molecular layer over there, and so on and so forth. And you see you have a very nice linearity. This uh, is typical for tunneling behavior. And you can also turn the capacitance. The interesting part of this work, apart from the technology point of view, is that we managed to extract the constant dielectric dielect constant of these, these molecules that was basically calculated for different methods. You measure directly the dielectric constant of the system. And you get about 2.5. That is more or less what people have obtained in the past years. All right, uh, moving a little bit, how can you do sensing elements with nanomembranes? So the first approach, uh, or actually, yeah, both approaches start simultaneously, but I'll present this one. That is basically using 3.5. Here, the sacrificial layer is not germanium dioxide, but it's a sacrificial layer of aluminum arsenide. And the membrane is based on indium gallium arsenide and gallium arsenide. So it's strained, but not so much, so that you don't form quantum dots, but the layer is under stress. And then when you remove with AGF, the system curves. The difference is that you, you built a field effect transistor on top of this layer, and after you roll, actually your contacts are embedded in the system. So uh, you can see a source drain. Maybe in this picture you can see our tube. Different source, gate, drain. Then again, this can be a source, gate, drain. So you have a long tube that is built different transistors in there. So why have we done that? So basically now we simply put a droplet inside of this tube and measure. In this case, we fix our source drain current and start to swing our gate voltage. What you see, in the moment you inject water in the system, you have a difference. And then you basically repeat this for different solutions. And what you see, there is a correlation. We still don't know which correlation uh, exactly is this, because it's play a lot of your surface, how it happens, what is going on the surface. It's a still ongoing project. And uh, what you see, depending on uh, the dielectric constant, you can really increase or shrink the difference between these two gate voltages. And also, if you see, maybe if you force your eyes, you can see also get sharper or larger. So it means we, we are sensitive to the surface. And since you can uh, roll it, we can also direct our fluid inside of the, the system. So similar things we did also using germanium platform. But dif the difference is that now we have uh, as active layer uh, a conducting polymer. In this case, it was polypyro. The main reason is the polypyro, the conductivity depends on the quantum ion you embed in your system. So if you remove the quantum ions, the material gets basically insulating, and if you put the quantum ions back, you can recharge the material. Okay, then we decide to put this layer to try to work as a sensing based on a few uh, uh, acids, for instance, but end up with gases. So how we pattern this? Uh, we simply create a, a, a route where we have the germanium dioxide, you have an always strained layer in a chromium gold layer, then you polymerize on the top. Yeah, this is we developed a technique a few years ago that you can pattern polypyro very easily, and this layer is about, it can be 50, 70 nanometers, it can go out, down to 20 nanometers if it's needed. And then what happens after you remove the, the germanium dioxide in water, the, 
the polypyro is embedded inside of the tube. Okay, you made a little bit more development, how to place the contacts inside, you develop a new process, and what you have in the end is an array of several tubes where you have two contacts and the polypyro inside of the tube. You can see this IV trace. Before rolling, you can see the, the, the polypyro conducing. Here, after rolling, it drops a little bit more. The reason is that we roll in water, the polypyro try to you remove the contact ions, the material gets a little bit isolated, and then you put a little bit of HCl and you can recharge the system, but never as good as before. Yeah, the reason that you, you have a, a, a problem with a CO group that is, is, is created every time you charge or discharge the polypyro. This is a previous work we, we figure out this. And here's without the active layer, basically there is no current across your system. The trace simply uh, say that we are we have a transport in, in, in between the, the two electrodes and is across the polypyro. So it is a cross section. You can see the polypyro uh, thicker close to the contacts. So we cut the tube along it, and here is perpendicular. And if you look here, you have a, a quite fancy heterojunction, yeah, where you have a metal, uh, oxide, and polymer, and so on and so forth. Yeah, is a junction. If you try to do layer by layer by deposition, for instance, you cannot prepare it and you can get by rolling. If you be able to remove the tube and make a top-down contact, you can try a, a transport. In the case of several semiconductors, here is a metal, is not that attractive, but nevertheless, is a type of uh, hybrid uh, structure. We tested different vapors, and you could see really that the, the material reacts very well. We didn't try liqu liquids here, basically by our incapacity to generate microfluidic devices by that time, to to inject fluids inside of the tube. So I also investigate the, the relaxation process when the gas leaves the system, and still uh, there is a lot of things to do. So another capability is patterning using uh, uh, the, the tube as an electrode, and I will show why. For those that work with uh, organic devices, especially uh, uh, thing vertical junctions, know that you have a, a typical problem of interdiffusion. So try to imagine the following. This is a uh, organic spin valve. That is the dream of organic spintronics. If you see, uh, if you go thinner, your magnetic resistance tends to increase. But to go thinner means how can you make your top contact? Yeah? It's well known. That there is a few problems that is, uh, are well known in, in this case. First, if you have a, a very thin film, you can form clusters. Then you have a pinhole. And then if you make the deposition, basically you have a short circuit here. Another problem, you can even have a, a continuous film, but depending on the thickness, you have interdiffusion of metallic atoms that make up your results in the best case. Yeah? So, uh, Haik and Kain basically summarize the main problem. The first, if you have a junction, you never know if the conduction comes from, from pinholes. Because of the thermal energy during the deposition, you never know how end up your bonds. So, making top contacts in organic uh, devices is a problem, and it's still a problem. Especially if you go to thin devices, if you want the picture I showed you before, if you think about uh, a very thin layer, smaller than 40 nanometers, how can you be sure that your contact is across the organic layer? So then you came up with this idea of using a membrane to doing this. The concept was simple. And the bottom electrode is exactly what everybody else does. But the top one, you use a tube for that. The, the advantage of that is a pinhole proof. Why is a pinhole proof? Yeah, because it's like a flag on a crown. Yeah, this you lie on top of your molecules, and you never touch the bottom. So even if you had some guys that are really not supporting Brazil, and want to be sitting, and don't want to hold the flag, it doesn't matter. The flag will be there lying on top of the molecules. The problem is that you never know exactly how many molecules you are contacting. But actually, nobody knows that. Even if you make a deposition, you have to make an assumption that you are, you are of ideal area. OK, so we have a soft contact. First, because it's a low temperature, because you roll in liquid, so room temperature contact. Large scale, I show, because in our device, you can have 100 devices on a ship. It is more than you can really measure or characterize. You can have a versatile composition, since I can change the material uh, onto my tube, I can do basically any combination respecting the selection rules of the rolling process. And it's a self-adjusting gap. Okay, first I put a molecule, then I put the, the, the contact. Yeah? Not really a lateral gap, that you put a, a gap and then you hope that you have a bridge, you, you can bridge your molecule. So then yeah, it's a soft mechanical and self-adjusting contact. 
So our first work was simply repeating what people have done in the past two years, simply characterizing uh, alkanotiols. What we should expect when you contact, if you change the number of carbons, you should see uh, a tunneling behavior, direct tunneling. Uh, and we did this with different, uh, quite a beautiful curve. It's an exception, in me, you know this, those that measure cannot get such a nice curve. Uh, our, our problem was always the stability of this junction. You can measure once, uh, the, the second time is already horrible, and the third is impossible to, to understand. Anyway, we managed to get the very nice results in, in several uh, occasions. And um, yeah, this is how it looks like really the surface. We are picturing this, but in reality, what you have here and also on the top is a roof uh, structure. So uh, how is the limit of this technology? The roughness of your surface and the, the, the linear uh, size of your, your, your molecules. Let's assume you have a two nanometers roughness here, two nanometers roughness here. Uh, basically, you cannot measure one nanometer layer. Yeah, otherwise, you have a short cycle. It would be like needles inside of your, your organic layer. So uh, even though we managed to do a lot of investigation down to 6.5 nanometers phytalocyanine, for instance, uh, here we develop a system that we have a strand layer in a finger where you put our copper phytalocyanine. And when you remove the sacrificial layer, the tube tends to roll and stop on top of your finger. So in the end, what you have is a gold, copper phytalocyanine, gold. Yeah, quite a standard junction. The difference we are measure not 50, but 6.5 or around 6 as well. So the, how this works, can you see that this is the strain layer. Here's my finger. So I start to roll the system, the, full, the tube forms. In the end, it lays on top of my layer. Here's like how it looks like the surface after I remove the tube. Basically, I have a micro roller that also planarizes the film. So the, a few devices on the surface and a zoom in this region. And I uh, also did a lot of electric characterization. You can see really crossover between uh, thermotivated process and tunneling. And uh, you figure out a lot of uh, figure of merit here. And you manage also to draw a map of my stroke. That is the final figure of this paper, where you can simply map as a function of electric field and temperature, which kind of transport mechanism we have. Uh, where we are now, we just finish exchanging these layers by ferromagnetic layers, and we start to work with copper phytalocyanide. So it is, you can draw a conclusion that you start to apply a magnetic field. So we are interested really to see a spin polarization in this kind of molecular magnets. So going back to this picture to explain a little bit of developments, we have worked a lot on this area and this area. Simply, this one is still waiting for founding. Yeah. So the first analysis was water and ethanol. You know that it's, uh, when you mix your water and gasoline, it's pretty easy. You can see by eye what happens. But when you do water and ethanol, you start to have a problem. You go to the gas station, you will tank your car. Uh, what's going on? Yeah, 3 a.m., you know, the guy taking care of the gas station. You think he's sleeping, but actually he's pour water in the tank. You know? So the next day, you, you go tank your car. You know, you don't see the problem, but you see just the problem uh, a few months ago. Yeah? So, thanks God, it's not a problem only in Brazil. Yeah, actually, the news I got in the US is tempering. So, uh, I could not say we are the only ones that uh, do this kind of thing. Uh, so, we came up with a solution. We developed a sensor. It's an interdigitated electrode, and we have a, a special coating that is now patented in Brazil, and now we simply uh, send it to patent in the US as well, in Europe. Uh, basically, you can determine the amount of water in ethanol by capacitive measurements. Uh, here's a few experiments. You can see the one gas station is a little bit lower than limit because this is the limit for, for a, a standard distillation process. You get always 93%. If you want more, you have to use molecular seeds, and the ethanol is too expensive. It's not uh, worth for tanking. It means you are working in this region. So we have two regimes, uh, uh, two ranges of operation. Here could be, for instance, for, for drink industry or cosmetic industry to know the amount of ethanol in water. And now here for cars, the amount of water in ethanol. So you can see very interesting numbers. And uh, here is a, there is a, 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 a public company in Brazil that uh, bought the cheapest ethanol. Actually, in the end, they bought the most expensive ethanol. That 30% was simply water. 
yeah, and uh, since there is no way to gauge this, what I mentioned about uh, labels, yeah, you trust what is in the label, but can you really trust? Yeah, so here, uh, domestic ethanol, this is the cheapest one in the, in the supermarket. This one was, uh, no, actually this one was the cheapest one. This is a very well-known label in Brazil. People always think you have a, uh, better quality paying the highest price, not necessary. And here's the, the one they sell for those that want to pay really cheap things. Yeah. So there is one gas station that was suspicious, but we still think, okay, this is a, a gas station f uh, really f uh, in the, uh, not in the countryside, but in the, in the outside of the city. So not so many people tanking ethanol over there. It means that ethanol stay a long time in the, in the gas station. This is one reason I had to solve water. So this is the vision we have now, and we're working with this uh, other organization in Brazil to develop uh, electronics. Actually, what we want to do is uh, the, the track the ethanol from the production plants to the car, uh, the gas station, or the cars. So uh, our full solution package is under development right now. Uh, the hardest part, as you know, is the cars that has to pass for several for batteries of tests to go into your car. And another possibility now, uh, we are also on the develop, is uh, the amount of ethanol in gasoline. That is the actually most important. But those that work with gasoline knows how complicated it is to really uh, figure out what's inside of the gasoline. Another uh, area of interest, that, as I mentioned, is the environmental monitoring, basically water. And Brazil is dependent of water in different levels, uh, from energy till human consumption, direct for drinking from the, the source. Or fishing or agriculture. Um, then we start to think about uh, how to, to track a few analytes. And first was quite broad. Now we, we come to a few analytes that are extremely relevant for the next years. Here's a picture of what they, they do uh, when you have these microphytes and, and hydroelectrics before it was mechanical. Now they simply pour the agrotoxins inside of the, the, the water. So actually, they care. They don't care so much who is going to use the water afterwards. The point is, uh, you have a strong legislation, but nobody has tools to verify what's going on in the water. Uh, we have done a few works in the past for acid detection in flow systems. As you can see here is the, the detection of different acids over eight orders of magnitude, the same sensor. So this is a work we still uh, finishing now for send for publication, but it can go from 200 picomolar to, to 20 micromolar. There is nothing to do in principle with nanomembranes, but all this formation of a hybrid interface came from the nanomembrane. Once you are able to form the heterojunctions and understand the transport across this, this, this heterojunction, you could visualize how can you use this also on planar and conventional systems. This is simply to highlight the, the potentialities of combining these organic and organic layers. So, as a conclusion, yeah, basically a phrase I, I, I stole from Rogers, Nuzo, and Lagali about the nanomembranes. They have uh, they spend a lot of time playing with this, but I think it's a quite interesting field. Uh, now, if we managed to get the tube technology uh, rolling for a few uh, interesting things like shrinking devices and uh, also for the sensing elements to confine liquids or confine uh, other nanostructures inside of the tubes and also analyze them and also uh, the potentiality to contact in molecular layers. Of course, if you think about application of using a tube for a device that goes to the market, oh, this is really far from, from this point. But to understand really how is the transport, the, the charge transport across very thin layers where we have, for instance, convolution between thermoactivated transport and tunneling is a very interesting point because in this point, in this uh, uh, intersection, is where you have the transition of large area and uh, small contacts or in between the analysis or the data you get from STM and the data you get from a standard electrical measurement. Basically, you try to bridge this gap. How far can I say that uh, uh, a combination of different molecules in parallel are the same of a film? Uh, so you can do this uh, at least using one of uh, on, on the approaches on, on, on nanomembranes. And next, when I think about my context, basically the Brazilian challenges, the hybrid platforms, they are a very attractive approach. We have a, a few indications, a few problems that, that we start to address, and now we are consolidating most of them. And we still believe that you can, having this hybrid platform is a, a quite uh, interesting pathway. 
And with this, I'd like uh, yeah, to conclude my talk. Thank first the people that I worked with me in the past, you know, helping a lot of the, the data, the founding agencies, and my incomplete team. There is a few, a few four members missing here, but they helped really to set up the lab in the last uh, two and a half years. Also, uh, really a lot of technical challenges to doing science with this level in Brazil is uh, we are a little bit outside of the main axis, especially when talking about important things, you know, sometimes a thing that you have in the lab here in three days will take us three months to get there. And then how can you do science if you're not fast enough? So actually they did a pretty good job and, and were able to, to keep our new labs already running. Uh, consider Brazil to have a, a microfabrication facility, electric facility in two years. I think it was uh, quite a success, and uh, mainly I want to thank my group for that. So, and of course, thank you for your, your attention. If you have some questions, I'd be glad to answer, and also my email for contact. Thanks very much, Carlos. Time for questions. Yes, Michael. Just curious, how do you engineer the strain there? Like, what is the. the yeah. Thing you're using? Okay, so uh, we have a few recipes. Uh, one is uh, really look into f data that fail. In the, if you get papers from the 60s and 70s, that people trying to, to get the, the stress configuration and the stress into the material, you could see clear the combinations that fail miserably. One of those is titanium chromium. Yeah, all the things you can see, the chromium, for instance, you can go from tensile to compressive stress by simply changing the, the pressure that you deposit the chromium. So all this information we put in our basket and when you're going to engineer the system uh, we, we use. For instance, everybody knows that the gold doesn't stick very well on silicon dioxide. Perfect. It means when I to do my germanium dioxide, I don't put titanium chromium straight for the germanium. I put a gold because there's a poor adhesion. So then when I remove the sacrificial layer, comes uh, just to have an idea, when we start developing this roll technique, it took us sometimes three hours to roll a tube. Now take us five minutes. Yeah, actually it could be faster, but we, we know the diameter is correlated with the rolling speed. So then you, you reach a limit where you can have a very compact tubes and shorter rolling time. So. Yes? Do you have hysteresis in your response? In some cases, yes. Yeah, and. Uh, uh, the the phytalocyanines, no, there is a dry regime, but uh, in the sensors, uh, the organic sensor, yes. One of the reasons we gave up with the liquids in the polypyrrole inside the tube was exactly the hysteresis that makes, and it's continuous, but this is a, not a fruit of the, the states, but the degradation of the material in liquid. Uh, the gases is a m more often high voltage, then we keep a low voltage, then it's okay. Yeah, but, yeah. How do you deploy the sensor? Uh, those that are reported here can, can be multi-use. The polypyrrole can use up to 10 to 15 times. The, the, the semiconductor-based one is less because, I mean, the, the, the gallium arsenide is, is supposed to leak more often. Then you start to have, uh, have oxidation and then you, you, you lost the performance. Yeah, this is a proof of concept. Uh, now we can try to engineer. With polypyrrole, we managed to get some recipes during the polymerization, especially what concerns the, the, the polymerize in the a, in a, in a absence of oxygen, for instance. This improves a lot, this kind of uh, response. Also, the right choice of, of the electrodes. For instance, uh, platinum is very good for polypyrrole, for instance, but during the polymerization, it has a catalytic effect and then grow too much on the electrodes and not in, in between the, the, the contacts. So then you have a inhomogeneous film. But the gold is not as good as, as platinum for charge injection. Nevertheless, you can get a smooth film. In both cases, you can have no hysteresis. Yeah, other combinations uh, like silicon for, for injected charge and polypyrrole, that is huge hysteresis. It's mainly to do, uh, to, to, uh, is, a, is a your depletion layer at the interface. Yeah. In the future, you need to increase the surface area contact. In the contact, in the in the in the sensing, yeah. to confine the liquid, it's simply like a, a roll-up microfluidic channel. Yeah, so we actually your sensor is your microfluidic channel in both cases. So you have a microfluidic sensing element. So if you want to, like ah, on the top, I do a PDMS uh, uh, structure. If you remember that picture, I saw several tubes uh, very well aligned. If you make a, a, a engineer that so entering one tube, believes entering another one, you can create a pathway with different tubes, 
Each tube can be differently functionalized, so you have uh, tube-like sensors for microfluidic. This was the idea, to create uh, what some of my colleagues in the past called a lab in a tube. Not a lab in a ship, but you have sensors confining, really uh, by electrophoresis move, uh, cells inside. All of these, uh, some of my colleagues published in the past, uh, reviewers and so on, the concept of a lab in a tube. And our contribution was, okay, energy storage is one possibility, sensing other possibility. Other colleagues show confinement of cells, other show magnetic uh, switches, everything in a tube. So it's a concept. Yes. No, I mean the force is really strong which one roll is. I mean, yeah, after roll, I mean even mechanically, if you you, you can see, we we try once to one roll with AFM tip. We didn't manage to unroll the AFM tip. Yeah, you can break the tube, but you cannot unroll. You can break where it's is holded, but you cannot. Even is a uh, in uh, along the rails, you can sometimes smash the tube and go back elastically. It's, it's quite impressive. Uh, the amount of tension you have in this, in those materials. Okay. Yeah. Yes. yes. Uh, so for the application as a hot content for organic materials, how do you ensure traction? Yeah. You can measure. Yeah. Measure the IV trace. If it's not touching, you don't have get current. Yeah, this is the idea, to be sure that it's touching. Okay. Yeah, but we, we did in different levels. We have an experiment I didn't show here where we changed the, the, the height of this finger to the point that this, uh, the, the tube just touch slightly or lose the contact. We didn't see any difference uh, from those devices. I mean, the pressure in this case, the tube pressure on the organic layer didn't make any difference. In some extent, uh, in some cases, yeah, it makes a difference because the roughness basically smashed the tube and I have a short circuit. But uh, yeah, this was one question that passed me. If the pressure you apply in there, if it's enough, it should see difference in the transport or change molecular orientation, whatever. Yeah, of course, one, one interesting possibility is think about if you have, let's say, a 10 nanometers layer and you have uh, two nanometers here, two nanometers there, of in fact, you have six nanometers of transport pathway. So then let's do the, the math. I mean, if you put five, maybe I have one nanometer. Yeah, but you, the point is, is in average. You have to look at actually to the roughness peak to peak to see if, uh, if you, you have a short circuit or not. So the exciting part here is that, okay, I have an area, but because of the roughness of the system and the peak to peak, it might be that my transport, in fact, is localized in some regions. And I might be probing a just a small cluster of molecules. Yeah, it will be like a, a solid state, uh, as, uh, not STM, but uh, when you do the, the AFM contacting there. So, and this is one, one, I didn't show in details that result, but we could obtain, for instance, from the transport measurement, the molecular orientation. Yeah, we can get the dielectric constant of the system, and you, 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 there are some theory uh, work showing that the, the dielectric constant along the molecule is about 13, the copper phthalocyanine, and 2.5 perpendicular. We actually got a, about 13. So it means that most of our transport might be along the molecule. So it's a number. Everybody gets 2.5, yes, but they use lateral devices and a gap of a 50. Uh, 50 to 100 nanometers to get charge injection. And of course, there if you think about the distribution of orientation, it's mainly uh, parallel to the substrate. But if you see the, the electron photospectroscopy measurements, say that the first layers of uh, copper phthalocyanine on gold or even silicon, they, are, they come perpendicular to the, to the surface. So this is an indication that might be that you are probing actually a few regions in the, in the, in the layer. But is a really, what is happening underneath the tube is a mysterious because you cannot see. Uh, how is our charging, how is your uh, area of injection? I can estimate, but I cannot really tell, tell you how much it is. So I can tell you the electric field, but uh, the, the, uh, for the manuscript we estimate, the, the review asks us, I estimate, if I look, but it, this is, uh, I, we cannot trust, could be uh, is one order above or below. Um, 
Yeah. Yes. Uh, we are we are talking about uh, we are talking about a, a few nanometers, five to ten nanometers oxide layer covering. It means this is leakage. Yeah, this leakage current across your system. Yeah, and you can see when you put the molecule, this tends goes towards minus ninety. It means we are suppressing this leakage current. So it's grown by a low temperature ALED. So you should expect leakage current. But the most important feature there is that my electrode is completely coated. Uh, it means we don't have, you are not exposing your, your metallic electrodes to buffer solution. That is the main reason for uh, uh, losing reproducibility in this kind of sensor. So inherent properties. Yes, yeah. Nevertheless, you can, even though you can get the correlation, yeah? I mean, this is, you can make thicker, but then the, the, the separation between molecule and electrodes gets larger. It means we, we are decoupling uh, what we have now, the oxide is the coupling, but we still have a shadow or a membrane of the, the, the molecule at the surface of the oxide. Have any of these, uh, these uh, non-membrane-based sensors been commercialized? Uh, Mitchell, I think. Uh, I think it's a, it's a long pathway to get a really... Uh, we start working on this again now that you have infrastructure that can be more reproducible, and uh, uh, there are a few uh, uh, topics on microfluidics that we could enter with this kind of, uh, of device. Yeah, that should be maybe a medium term, could be a solution. Yeah, the question, I mean, we have to be very critical. Can you reproduce in a planar fashion? Why should I use a, a strain engineering that is more complicated? Yeah, because a sensor to me is you have to roll an oxide tube, put a metallic electrode, there's a lot of, a lot of steps and losses. I mean, how is the wheel? The capacitor you manage to reach 97 percent, you know, but uh, when you roll an oxide, this is a problem. The oxide has a lot of defects. You start to roll from the right, from the left, the laminate breaks. I mean, uh, the, the, the everyday reality in the lab shows that we have to, to debug a lot. But one direction, I think, is really these uh, embedded sensors in a tube is already, uh, is already one interesting, uh, should be the closest to one to application. The capacitor can be also, if you think about uh, embedded energy storage, but then you have to move to even high K oxides or ceramics, and then roll ceramics is already a tough process because it should be sputtering, high temperature, has to survive the process. And I mean, the, the key points that you have to use to, to, to make a decision if you want to migrate for some materials has to be well designed for rolling. Yeah, but uh, what I see for the rolling is a very nice platform to to investigate this, uh, some systems that you want to export for a large area. This is the case of the hybrid uh, heterojunctions. I can understand better the heterojunction with a roll-up structure, but use the whole layer in another device, in a conventional interdigitated electrode in a, as a passivation surface on a field effect transistor. But the understanding comes there because there I have a platform that can access the transport in a regime that other methods cannot do in a reliable fashion by now. Yeah. The, the international marketplace for sensors is enormous. Yes. So, you know, it may not be that difficult to find a unique application. Yes, yeah. This, yes, this is what we, we figure out. This is what I'm telling about the sensors for roll up. Because that exact, the demand is so huge that might be that for a, a few uh, uh, cases, this could be very attractive. Yeah. And uh, of course, there is a few uh, steps that we have to, 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 to go through. But a friend of mine just published last year, uh, if I'm not wrong, ACS Nano, where he built a similar system that I do, I, I, I did the, the, the polymer incorporation, but he simply have two electrodes, he, and he can count cells. Every time a cell passed inside the tube, he can get a very nice and sharp peak. It was quite nice, I mean, and he incorporated in the, in the lab, lab in a ship system. I mean, it could be one, one case. Yeah, he successfully did this. So might be one direction. Perhaps I could just ask one thing before you, you finish. Can you explain uh, the, the, uh, the uh, role of the organizations you have there, CNT, QNET, Here. And uh, okay. CISNANO is uh, the Brazilian uh, 
virtual system for nan nanotechnology. Actually, uh, uh, laboratories spread in Brazil credential to this, to this uh, network, so in principle you can use all the, these labs of the network. The idea is... Uh, is That's something we don't have. Yeah, the idea is uh, enhance this collaboration and avoid duplicating or buying uh, the same expensive infrastructure. So you have uh, different labs that can supply uh, the equipments you can use uh, if you are inside of the network, you can freely use the system or the devices. It's more or less like this. CNPq is our is our uh, uh, federal uh, uh, agency for financing research and in the scholarship or in everywhere. Or research institute, universities, uh, all the federal levels. Also, the programs you expect from Brazil, Canada comes from. You can probably from CNPq as well. The FINEP is. Uh, is a is larger for big infrastructure, has correlation for industry as well. So the FINEP has this kind of uh, basically huge projects inside of universities and companies as well, are founded by FINEP. And FAPESP is the Sao Paulo State uh, Research Foundation, is a, is a uh, basically the, the differential for and us, it's as a unique Paulo system for Sao Paulo. Yeah. yeah and, Basically, we, all these people was all this organization was involved in, the, in implementing the new labs. Uh, basically, part of the money came from Cisnano, <laughs> scholarships, and also my productivity scholarship come from CNPq. The FINEP also provides money not only just for us but for the center uh, as a whole, and the FAPESP by individual project and also uh, a lot of stuff inside the lab. Uh, equipments are paid by by them. Okay, well, I uh, hope you will join me in, in thanking, uh, thanking Carlos for a, a very interesting uh, and potentially, uh, I think, valuable area of research. Thank you.